Uh, this is all aboard the Locomotion, and um, we're here to tell you a little bit about Locomotion, which is currently upstairs just now. You can play it. Um, you can actually play three worlds currently in the current build. And it's really this whole talk is, um, I'm just here briefly to introduce it, uh, followed by the rest of our team who are going to walk through the actual development of it from its original concept idea all the way to the demo that you see today uh, in GF. So first of all, to introduce myself, I'm Tommy Thompson. Uh, I'm actually, if you were around yesterday, you would have seen me at the Sure Footing talk, uh, Run to the Hills, uh, because that's the game that I work on as programmer. Um, I'm also acting as a producer here on Locomotion as part of what has now been dubbed Team Loco. And I'm producer alongside Dr. Barris Issegunner. And the reason that Barris and I are producers will make a lot more sense in a couple of slides. But I'm just here just to kind of introduce the game and talk about what this was all about and how we started putting this together. Locomotion's actually got a university assignment. But what the final product is when it was actually put together is a puzzle game. And players need to collect gold in a variety of worlds and get to the exit in the shortest time possible. And you're driving a train. And you get to push carriages, you get to use switches, turn turntables, pressure plates and everything. And we've managed to get over, what is, is it, how many levels is it exactly? 17 levels across three different worlds. So the worlds change around you and it introduces new environmental challenges and uh, cool new music and cool new art and what have you. But it all started as a university assignment. So Team Loco as it is, is a bunch of university students. And this is where Barris and I came in. So this is a, com a combined effort by the MSc and the MA in computer games development at Anglia Ruskin University, which is based out in Cambridge. Now, I am the course leader for the MSc in computer games development, and Barris is the course leader on the MA. And the way we structure it is they will work together for two trimesters, and originally, um, they would come in with one brief, and this happened in September, October time, that the two of us would run this class together. Now, it's an interesting problem for us because that no other class like this exists in the entire university. There's no collaborative capacity like this because one of the big things is that the MA is actually based in Arts, Law and Social Sciences at Anglia Ruskin, which is part, and specifically in the Cambridge School of Art. Meanwhile, I work in the Computing and Technology Department within the Faculty of Science and Technology. There is no other course in the university where two courses from completely different faculties work together in the same class at the same time. It's caused me a massive number of administrative headaches, but that's not the point of today. And so what we wanted to do was to give them a brief and say, right, can you actually build a prototype off this in 12 weeks? And we got in touch with uh, some friends of ours at Ghost Town Games, uh, Phil and Ollie. Anyone happen to hear of Overcooked? So Phil and Ollie are the two supremely talented gentlemen behind Overcooked, and we're really privileged to have them come in sometimes and talk to our students. And we said to them, guys, have you got something, like something we could actually show and get like maybe get the students to work on in this capacity. And they said, well, actually, we've got this, this idea for a puzzle game. And there's a simple, scalable mechanics, all about collecting items, this really clean art style. And it was involving trains. And it was inspired largely by Captain Toad's Treasure Tracker on the Wii U, which I love. Um, so I was really excited when that was presented to us. And then originally, it was 12 weeks to prototype it. And the team successfully did that, and you'll see that. But also then it was a case of, do you want to go and do something else for the second trimester, or do you want to bring this up to a polished standard that you could, you know, take it to a games festival and show it off? And the team agreed, yes, that's how they'd go about it. We want to continue working on locomotion, because I think we all agreed at the end of the first 12 weeks there was something there, something really worth showing off. And so this is kind of the spec that was given to us by Ghost Town. In fact, the original idea had been developed within them internally. They'd originally came up with this idea and then they decided not to work on it because, you know, you have lots of other ideas for games and you go and pursue something else. And clearly, uh, pursuing uh, Overcooked turned out to be a good idea for them. To actually get into the, the, bit, the actual flow of this, I'm going to step down because at this point, I'm not doing any of this. I'm just coming in every week and uh, mentoring and overseeing the process. So Isaac who has been our project lead for the last two trimesters, is going to take over. And I'm done. Thank you. OK, so um, the first thing we had to do after defining the world of locomotion was to figure out how do we work together as a team and how can that work for this project. So um, as you can see, we followed a pretty standard structure. We grey boxed the levels, we added the mechanics and the art. Um, and the fact that it needed to be modular in construction kind of pushed us to the point where the game had to be had to become modular in every aspect. That includes the mechanics, they're all drag and drop, 
um, the art, even the audio is all in little pieces and snapped together. Um, in the short term, this caused us a lot of work, um, you know, producing every tiny little piece. <laughs> but in terms of expandability for the game, it actually allows us a much broader scope to um, grow into in the future, building new levels. It, it only takes new art and we already have the mechanics in place to put together. So it's just new art and music that we need for that. Okay, All right. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> so I'm lead programmer and uh, I'm gonna talk about how you know we put everything together. So behind locomotion is a lot of maths and a little bit of physics. As you can see from the picture, when we do play a physics, we have flying trains. That's not something we want. Uh, so uh, one of the main problems we faced with locomotion was uh, how we were going to get the train to move uh, smoothly along the tracks, round slopes or ramps. Because in real life, you don't want your train coming off the tracks, let's face it. So uh, we went off, programmers, and uh, we came back a few days later, and we came up with our own path system uh, based around Bayesian curves. And if anyone's interested in the maths behind it, it's a quadratic equation. These paths uh, allow us to do things like orient the train, its position in world space, uh, its rotation. And uh, like Isaac mentioned, everything's modular. So each track piece has its own uh, path, uh, curve, ramp, uh, even a straight path. And our designers will come along and they'll drag and drop these together in the scene. And uh, at the beginning, this was actually a really tedious process because it required the designers to select each path and drag in another path, its neighboring path. And if you've got 100 plus tracks, that is, you're looking at 40 to 50 minutes worth of work. And if you make a mistake, you're gonna, you're gonna have a fun time fixing it. So we went away again, we came back with our own little system that would automatically c connect each of these paths which reduced our designers' times to create levels down to about 10 minutes, which was great because we wanted to give our designers the freedom to come in and design their levels quickly and efficiently. If they wanted to change something, it wasn't too much of an issue. Uh, yeah. So um, each object in the game is actually prefabbed and ready for the designers to drag and drop in, snap together, uh, whether that's tiles, track pieces, uh, any of the mechanics. Um, and work with the automatic path connection system, it all happens at the press of a button. So, like I said, throw it all together, press a button, the level is ready to go. It does come with some issues sometimes, but we fix those. Um, that's my job. So, some of the mechanics, if you've played the game upstairs, uh, you'll notice we've got things like switching tracks, moving platforms, uh, carriages, like. Uh, magnets and fans, turntables, and you know, every time one of the designers comes up to us and they're like, you know, Ian, I want to be able to do this, I'm going to say yes. The reason why I can say yes to a lot of the stuff they ask for is because uh, a lot of our interactions, they work off the same information, they have the same code base. And if anyone's a program your audience and you've heard of inheritance, that's what we use, and we can easily implement new interactions quickly. Unless it's the day before release, then no, no, it's not going to happen. Yeah, so again, all of this is set up with a click of a button. Uh, I'm really just trying to make the lives of everyone easier. I'm going to pass over to Holly, who will talk you about dressing levels. Hi, I'm Holly. I'm the art lead. Oh. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you how we made it look good. So we uh, started off by creating mind maps of like the different environments and themes that we could like try and look at creating. And our original influences were Overcooked and Captain Toad's Treasure Tracker. Click. Yeah. I'll start off with the first semester. Um, we began concepting up all our ideas as a team, no matter how out there they were. And uh, we started to go off with Western and then maybe thinking of different worlds that we could go on, maybe a jungle train, maybe trains in space. And uh, the first semester, the whole process was really new to us. We hadn't done this before. So it was really about getting to know each other so we know what um, 
so we could like know who can do what better and really identify our strengths and then we can start delegating roles to help make stronger work. So this is our old art. As you can see, it looks like a big, giant, dingy lasagna. And although this looks awful, it was actually a really good <laughs> learning curve for us to really like figure out like what to do. And we reflected on this, and then uh, we decided like we really needed a retune. So uh, the game went from looking like this to, ooh, ah, ah, oh. ooh, keep looking at it again, isn't that pretty? <laughs> so we pretty much did start the entire process again, um, having team members that came from an illustrative background in charge of like the drawing and concept art, because they were the stronger drawers in the team. Also at this point, we really started to explore different themes and environments. Um, as you can see there, there's jungle, arctic, space. And uh, our art style shifted into something um, more like overcooked and monument valley. So uh, the next step was like modeling and animating. So uh, once the concept artists had drawn up their concept, they gave them to the modelers who then uh, modeled them and then would rig them like our little cacti there who's dancing about, and um, our tiles were created one by one and would clip together in unity, so that's how we could build up our levels. Um, we kept constant communication in the art team, so we could constantly give each other feedback, so all that we would all like have separate roles, we would talk to each other, so we could really like get feedback to create stronger work. And next was colour, uh, no wait, have I skipped ahead again? Yeah, I have. Uh, next was texturing, so colouring in all the assets. Um, the concept artists were the ones that actually uh, created the textures by hand drawing them in Photoshop uh, directly onto the UV maps. This way we could maintain our cute cartoon cute cartoony cute art style. A lot of the textures we actually created in the first semester got reworked or completely redone because we ended up getting a lot better at it. So it only made sense to redo things that weren't living up to their potential. Uh, next was working in Unity, which as an art team, initially we were really scared of doing because we thought like we would go in and do something wrong and then it rip open a portal in time and completely destroy the whole project. <laughs> so, um, but thankfully we booked up a little bit and got involved. Um, so we started importing the assets ourselves and dressing up levels, messing about with lighting, the composition of how everything's laid out in Unity, because that's some, it, it only makes sense for us to do that because they've got the eye for it. Um, and if we had any questions or got stuck, we just screamed at Ian, as you can see the bottom left, like, what do we do? Um, one of the things that we did was we changed the camera from perspective to isometric, and it was, it was, it was just a revelation because it, it ended up looking more like the concept art. It actually fixed a few issues that we had with the camera. And finally, user interface, just tickets. Just tickets everywhere. Everything is just a ticket. Because for creating something, like something that is considered quite mundane, like menus and stuff, thought it would be a really playful way to try and address that and create something like cute and cartoony and true to the art style. Also, we used, um, we actually have a hand-drawn text that we've put into the game to create some of the tickets that are more like authentic and stuff. And as you can see, our little tutorial conductor guy in the bottom right corner. And back to Isaac. So, as well as being project lead, I also did the audio for the game. Um, and when I, when I approached it, I came to the... Oh, I didn't come to the conclusion. There were two main aspects of the game that I needed to address. How was I going to do the sound effects? How was I going to do the music? Um, the sound effects is just feedback. It's all just auditory feedback, to be honest. None of it's sort of flavourable. It's all just there to serve the player and inform them about what's going on in the game. The music, however, it is based off of a re uh, recurring theme, so I'm just going to play you a little extract. So it starts with this main theme that you will hear in the main menu. Yeah, 
so, and then as you travel to the different worlds, it builds on this. So when you go into the Western world, the appropriate instrumentation comes in. Uh, and so like, and here's space, for example. Uh, it was good because it allowed for a constant rhythm, constant movement, and a tempo that the player would constantly be moving at, constantly. Um, and this was also helpful because it was made up of modular parts. So the soundtrack would be brought, the stems would be brought in individually. And so the, the user will never hear the same soundtrack um, again. Well, they might, but not in the same way because each stem is um, played randomly. So it's never in the same structure. Um, this is good also because it makes it easier for the future. So we have uh, space, uh, jungle, and western, but then also if we wanted something like an Arctic theme, we could do something like this. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> yeah, so as well as that, um, I was also project lead. So. I'm going to reflect on what didn't go well with the team. What, how could we have improved? Um, well, the first thing I would say is team structure. Uh, that was something that was a challenge for all of us, I think. But for me personally, um, I, th I wanted to have everybody involved. And so what we would do is we'd have sort of a group forum discussion where everybody would voice their opinions on the game. Everybody would talk about how they wanted the game to be improved and what they wanted for it. Uh, the problem with this is, is that there are 12 of us, and if we're all suggesting ideas at the same time, then we're all just yelling at each other and no one's deciding anything. Um, so deliverables and discussions would take quite a while. Uh, something else that you could say uh, perhaps could have been improved on was the fact that the art needed a rework. This was quite a risk to do this, especially as we're halfway through, the, when, we, when we decided to do it, we were halfway through the development, and it took us 12 weeks up until that point to get Western to looking the way it did. So it was quite a risk to um, go, go ahead and do that. Um, and as with any game, we had lots and lots of bugs. So uh, what did go well? Uh, again, the team structure. <laughs> um, so uh, after the 12-week after the period when we decided to really kick into gear, um, we decided that deliverables would be um, agreed upon between us three and we would um, take that to the group and then discuss those. Uh, that, made, that meant that deliverables were decided on very quickly, decisions were made a lot faster, and we could work a lot better. Um, also, uh, reconfiguring our pipeline um, to be more efficient. We allowed the artists to come into Unity, which meant that a lot less um, back and forth needed to happen there. Uh, the artists could just do exactly what they want in the way they envisioned it. Um, and yeah, the formal, we introduced a more formal process for discussing feedback. People were given uh, work logs to do every week and they would fill out their work and then there they would express their concerns if they didn't believe that the, the work was going very well and then we could keep an eye on that and discuss it as a group. Okay, so yeah, and that, that's pretty much how we got to where we are today.